can vote now. CPR, so we've been, I've been sent emails around saying encourage people to vote, so encourage you to vote. Um, assignment two will be out soon, probably tomorrow. See the, um, see the web page and will be an announcement. The midterm is now in less than three weeks. It was only two weeks a few days ago, but now it's less than three weeks. And does anyone have any questions about anything before we start here? How was assignment one? Good, bad, uh. oh, that's good, it was middling, okay. All right. Um, so what we've done so far, in, we've looked at, been looking at constraint satisfaction problems. They're defined in terms of variables, domains, and constraints. We can solve them with search. So we looked at how to go about searching. Then we looked at arc consistency and arc. XC is arc consistent if for every value for X there are values for the other variables that satisfy the constraint. So that's, the, that's what we mean by arc consistency. It can be used to simplify the search space and domain splitting can be used to find solutions given arc consistency. Okay, any questions about any of that? All right. So let's do a couple of clicker questions to make sure we know what we're doing here. This is like the one that most people got wrong last time, so let's retry and see if we learned anything in the last few days. Domain of x is 1, 3, 5. The domain of y is 2, 3, 4. Making the arc y, x is not equal to y, arc consistent. A does nothing because it's already arc consistent. B results in 3 being removed from the domain of y. C results in 2 and 4 being removed from the domain of y. D results in 2, 3, or 4 being removed from the domain of Y, or E results in both domains becoming empty. How are we going? Does anyone need more time? Anyone need more time? No, good. Yay. Oh. A is the right answer. Why didn't everyone get A? You, we're not going to remove 3 from Y because there is a value for X which 3 is legal, right? So, we're not, so B is not right. So for those who wrote B, if you look at 3, we can't remove 3 from Y because there is a value for X, namely X is 1, or that makes 3 a valid an answer, a possible answer for Y. Okay, so the answer there is, is A. Any questions about that? Okay, let's do one more that's just like it. Domain of x is 1, 3, 5. The domain is y is 2, 3, 4. And the constraint is x is equal to y plus 1. And it's the arc between x and x is y plus 1. A, it does nothing because it's already arc consistent. B results in 3 being removed from the domain of x. C results in 1 being removed from the domain of x. D results in 3 and 5 being removed from the domain of x. Or E results in the domain of x becoming empty. Does anyone need more time? Anyone need more time? No, I wouldn't see anyone with their hands up. Let's stop that. C. All right. C is the right answer. Good. Hmm? Explain why? All right. So we're going to look for every value of x. We're going to look for whether there's a value for y which satisfies. So if x is 1, there's no value for y for which x is equal to y plus 1. So we're going to remove 1, right? Let's look at the value 3. Is there a value for y such that x is equal to y plus 1? So there is the answer is yes. The answer is y is 2. Similarly, for, for x is 4, 
x is 5, there is a value for y for which x is equal to y plus 1, namely y is 4. So all we're going to do then is remove 1. Yes? Hmm? Because we're not, this arc doesn't remove anything from y. This arc between x and this constraint removes values from x, not y. When we visit, there's two arcs that correspond to this constraint. When we vi visit the other arc with, with y, then we'll prune y. OK, does that make sense? And we'll do one more, just. Oh. Which of the following is false? If there is a solution, arc consistency we will not make any domains empty. B, arc consistency always halts for finite CSP. C, arc consistency involves consist checking constraints multiple times. Or D, arc consistency always results in single to domains if there is only one solution. So which of these is false? All right, how are we going? Does anyone need more time? Oh, that's exciting. All right, let's talk about each of them. Oh, no, we've lost it. The person who said E is not right, by the way. Um, so, so if there's, so it only makes domains empty if there's no solution, right? So if you prune it, you get there's, there's all the domains are empty, there's no solution. So A is not, so, so A is correct. If there is a solution, it won't make any domains empty. So A is not right. B, we're only checking each domain, so we're only going to cheat each domain finitely many times because we're going to, Whenever we prune a domain, we're going to keep rechecking it. So if there's only finite domains, we're going to check it finite many times, we're going to halt. Okay, so there's no way when we keep checking these domains that we can keep checking things infinitely often because we only recheck them when something else keeps getting smaller. And if everything's finite, it's always going to stop. So B's the wrong answer. So B is not, B is true. C is also true because we each time we have an arc, we have to recheck the constraints. So we recheck the constraints at least for every, like x and x is less than y, we at least check it for x and for y, but we check it each time one of the domain does it. So, so C is also true. And arc consistency always results in single to domain if there's only one solution is wrong. Is this one's not true. You can't tell if it's only got single to domains that there's one solution or no solutions Sorry. So if there's only one solution, it doesn't necessarily stop and find singleton domains. The other way around is, is true, but this one's false, right? So it doesn't always result in singleton domains if there's only one solution. If it results in singleton domains, then there's only one solution, but not this way around. Okay? So D is the correct answer here. D is the correct answer. Okay, any questions about that? So if there's only one solution, it might sort of end up with big domains and we have to do lots of searching. Okay, any questions about that? All right. So what we're going to do today is we're going to wrap up arc consistency and domain splitting, and then we're going to start talking about local search. So at the moment, so at the end of the class, we should be able to explain arc consistency and domain splitting fit, fit into a model of search, explain the complexity of arc consistency, and then we're going to trace local search for the simple cases, and hopefully we'll get to the stage of being able to compare local search algorithms. So at the end of last time, we ended up with, I think it was this slide, 
To solve a CSP, we simplify with arc consistency. If the domain is empty, we return no solutions. If all domains have size 1, we're going to return the solution found. Otherwise, we're going to split a, a domain and then recursively solve each half. Right? So this was the intuition that we gave last time. We did this by hand a few times. Right? So someone asked me, can you explain it a bit more? So let's do that. So here's the algorithm for doing this. So we're going to solve a CSP. We're first of all <coughs> going to simplify the CSP with arc consistency. Then if one domain is empty, we're going to return none. So if anything, we ever get an empty domain, we're going to return none. So if all the domains have one element, we're going to return a solution of that element for each variable. So we're going to return that. So if all the domains have a singleton element, we can turn that solution. Otherwise, we're going to select the variable with some domain that's bigger than one. We're going to split it, partition it into two halves, and we're going to solve each side of this. And I, I wrote an or here if we're going to solve one, if we're going to return one solution. So you, you just return the solution from the left or the solution from the right. If you want to return multiple solutions, you just return a set of solutions, and that be, all becomes a union. Okay, does that make sense? So that's this, the algorithm that's written down for that we did a number of times. Okay, does that make sense? But what I want, because what eventually you want to be able to get to the stage is someone just tells you the idea of an algorithm like this, right? And you should be able to know how this works. That's a skill that you should try and develop of someone describing a high-level description of an algorithm and for you to sort of know how to go one level deeper in that. So any questions about this? The other way we could view this is in terms of domain splitting as search. And remember when we defined a search problem, so we said we could use any search problem, so we could define this in terms of a search problem. So remember, a search space, we define nodes, neighbors of a node, which are the arcs. We define goals, and we define at a start node. So what are the nodes in this view of, what do the nodes here correspond to? If I'm viewing this as a search space, because I'm going to search it. Right, so this is the abstract, this is the, what we needed to introduce a search into our search before. Right, so when we did a search problem, we said, what are the nodes, what are the neighbors, what's the goal, what's the start node? Does anyone remember that? Yeah, vaguely. OK, so what are the nodes here correspond to? What we said it was a search problem, right? We just, so what are the nodes? Hmm? No, the nodes are here. No, the nodes are not the variables. The nodes here we're going to have. What are we going to split? We're going to. Right, remember what we did. We drew this thing. We had this arc consistent network. We made it arc consistent, then we split it on something. Right, so the nodes here are essentially going to correspond to the arc consistent domains. So it's the setup. So node here is all of the domains. OK, so what are the neighbors of a node? Well, the neighbors of a node are slightly more complicated. If all the domains are non-empty, we're going to select the very. So if all the domains are empty, we're going to stop. So if there's only nodes if all the domains are non-empty. Then we're going to select the variable with domain D with more than one element. We're going to partition D into D1 and D2. And then the neighbors of these two we're going to, are these two nodes, one of which is we're going to set x to d1 and make that arc consistent. And the other, no, the other child is we're going to make this x is to d2. Right? And when we kept drawing the trees last time, we kept, this is the graph that was implicitly there. Do you want me to do that example again? Yeah. Yes, good, thank you. All right, let's. Let's um, hang on, window. I'll set up this again. Actually, I actually hadn't set this up. That's fine. We'll do this. Constraint. 
file sample. Let's do two, I think, has the one with multiple solutions. And we'll. Can you read that? I should make it bigger. I'll make it slightly bigger. View. Oh, no, that's not very good, is it? View. All right. So what we did in here is we can start off with this domain. And remember, we did arc consistency on this domain. And we sat there and we said, and we could do arc consistency. And if this, what should hap happen quickly now? And you end up with this particular solution. So the first node is this particular graph with a is 1, 2, um, b is 1, 2, 3, etc. And now we want the neighbors of this node. So what are we going to do? We're going to select the variable. Now let's, let's make it. We're going to select the variable. Which variable should I pick? So the rules are I can pick any variable with this domain of size bigger than 1. So let's pick one. Which one should I pick? Just say it in that letter. E, thank you. We're going to select E. We're going to split it into two. Which two should we split it into? We've got to split it into half. So we're going to, right? So we split it into, say, two and three, four. Does that make sense? So we're going to split this. E. We're going to split it into two. Select the half, OK? And now we've got to this stage here. Now we're going to run, oh, let's go back to here. Now we're going to run our consistency again. OK, let's look at this. Right. So now we're going to construct the neighbors of this node here. Right, so we've partitioned it into two nodes. We're going to make it arc consistent. So we're going to make the first one arc consistent. Let's do, let's go back to here. All right, so we're going to make it arc consistency again. And we found there's no solution. Right, so then we've we found there are no, sorry. We found that we now ran this arc consistency, this node here, and we found out that there is there's no solution. So we went back and solved this one. Right, we went back to solve this node, and we found out there's no solution in here, because all the domains were empty. Now we're going to backtrack. This one actually just does depth first search on it to another network here. We can solve our consistency again. And if we do this, it's very quick, because I think it just stops. Now what could we split? Now we have this new node, which is this one. Right, A is still 1, 2. Um, and E is 3, 4. We split on, we're going to choose another variable. Which variable should we split on? It doesn't. We can choose whichever one. What do we want? How about D? I don't know anything about it. How about D? We can split on D. D is 2. Right, so we're going to split on D as 2, or D is 4. Now, what was it? I can't remember. And now we're going to run our consistency here. And we're going to end up with another solution, another node down here. Now, everything is singleton except B is 2, 3. And now we're going to, the only one we can select is B. OK. Whoops. What did I do? I didn't select anything. OK. OK. I can select B as 2. And I'm going to run auto arc consistency again. And it's 
we found a solution. B is 2, and we found a solution. I can backtrack, look at the B is 3 case, and if I solve this again, if I do auto arc consistency again here, I've found another solution. And this applet's actually showing me depth first search for this, so if I backtrack, I end up with D as 3. I'm at this node, then I'm going to do auto arc consistency, and I find that there's no solution again. Does that make sense? So the nodes here are complete CSPs with domains. I'm going to choose it, simplify them, and I'm searching effectively all the possibilities. Does that make sense? Yes? Sorry. These nodes here are the, the empty set. Oh, this one. Every set here is empty. So this one up here, this one, yes, this was the original problem, the domain of every, this had a domain of every variable. Yes? In this problem, every, well, there's every subset of every, well, it's a lot of states, um, is, there's a number, there's two to the num, there's the product of the state spies is this. The number of subsets of this. So it's the product of all the exponential of the number of all of those things. But we're never going to visit those. <coughs> right. Any questions? Yeah. So what's a goal node in here? What's the goal? What are we trying to find? When's, what's the solution? Yeah. Yeah, so all domains have size one. All domains have one element. And what's the start node? What did we start with? It was, yeah. Yeah, so essentially we're going to start with the original CSP. We're going to make it all art consistent. And the reason we're going to make it all arc consistency is because then we can check whether the domains are empty or not. So arc consistency is going to be used to simplify it. OK, any questions about that? So let's look now quickly at the complexity of arc consistency. And I'm just going to look at binary constraints. And each variable has a domain size of d, and there are e constraints to be tested. How how complex is checking a constraint? So now we're not looking at this graph. We're now, lo now looking at the, the CSP. Right, so we have CSP, and now we have just binary constraints, et cetera. But something can be heavy multiple. Right, we have this thing. How quickly can we check a constraint? How big are the constraints get? Hmm? Size d. You can get bigger than that with binary constraints. So for every, the constraints here can actually be size d squared, because they can be the pair of the domain sizes. Right, in fact, checking in. Remember, if we, for example, if we, oh, sorry. Actually, that should, actually, that should, let's make this, let's do the other way around. If we check an arc, x, r of x, y, how long does this take to check it? 
For every x, we need to go through all the y's, right? For every value for x, we need to go through all the values of y. So for every x, for each x, for each value for x, we need to go through, we need to, to, to check each value for y. Right, so this is order d squared. Does that make sense? So really we're checking constraints in d. That should actually be arc. Each arc needs to be checked how many times? What's the most number of times if this is x and this is y? How many times do we need to check this arc? Well, only the times, every time d, the most d times. Right, so each arc needs to be checked at most d times. So the algorithm then takes the number of edges times, times d cubed time. So for each of these edges, for each of these arcs, Chorus has to be checked, possibly gets checked d times, and each one takes d times squared times. Does that make sense? And solving a CSP is an NP complete problem for a bounded number of arguments for each constraint. So if you have a bounded number of arguments for each constraint, it's an NP complete problem. People know what an NP complete problem is? Who knows what that is? So an NP problem is something you can check the solution for quickly. So in this one here, if you have a solution, you can check it in polynomial time. But there are some, so that's what NP means. NP means you can do, do non-deterministic polynomial time. So NP is non-deterministic polynomial time. So that's NP. And it means we can check a solution in polynomial time. We can check a solution in polynomial time. So that's what, that's what N, this class of NP. And there are some certain classes of NP problems that are sort of equally hard as each other, and this is one of the very one of the classic ones of solving CSPs. But we essentially need to search for a solution. There's no algorithm that we know that we can solve it in faster than exponential time. But so there's so there's no known algorithm um, that can solve such problems. in polynomial time. And it's one of the great questions of computer science is, can we solve NP complete problems in polynomial time? Does NP, this class of NP complete problems, solve in polynomial time? OK. I'm not going to go into it. You'll find that in other courses. But just for now, knowing that this is one of the NP hard problems. So if you've seen it before, you can say, oh, I vaguely remember that from five minutes in this. OK, so you can solve it in polynomial time, because we can check the solution in polynomial time, right? We just, if you give me a solution, I can check it fast. But I can't find the solution fast. And it's not no, and in fact, in, no, it's widely believed that you can't solve this. We can't prove that we can't solve it. We just believe that we can't solve it. All right. Any questions? Yeah. E is the number of constraints to be tested. It's the number of edges, E, in there. All right. All right, let's go. So what we're going to do for the next, for the next part of the, for the next sort of week or so, 
As we're going to look at sort of local search, a whole lot of different algorithms that people use for solving problems. So what we're going to do there is maintain, so we'll get a whole different sort of class of methods for solving, approximatingly solve a problem. We'll see what we can do and what we can't do. So we're going to maintain this complete assignment of a value to each variable. We're going to start with some random assignment of, of values to variables. And we're going to repeatedly select the value variable to change or select the new value for that variable. And we're going to repeat that until we've found a solution. So it's going to effectively just keep selecting variables and we're going to change them until we've found a solution. This is what's called local search. So in here we're going to, <clears throat> so the aim is to find an assignment with, zero unsat with no unsatisfied constraints. So all the constraints have got to be satisfied. That's where we're trying to find some particular assignment. And given an assignment of a value to every variable, conflict is an unsatisfied constraint. So conflict is just a constraint that's, un that's unsatisfied. And the goal of what we're trying to do is to find an assignment with no conflicts. So conflicts are these unsatisfied constraints. And we are, what we're trying to do is to find, to find an assignment with no conflicts. And we're just effectively here, we're trying to minimize the number of conflicts. So we can think about here as is sort of like a heuristic function we did before, but here we're just trying to minimize the number of conflicts. We're effectively going to search through this space looking, trying to solve this. So here is the simple, one of the simplest algorithms we'll give. This is what we call the two-stage greedy descent. We're going to start with a random assignment of all the values to all the variables. Then we're going to repeatedly select the variable that participates in the most constraints. We're going to select one variable, and the variable we're going to choose is the one that participates in the most conflicts. Sorry. So it's the one that looks worst, that's the worst one. Then we're going to select the value of that variable that minimizes the number of conflicts. So we're going to try and do my best improvement. So I'm going to pick the worst variable, the one that's in the most conflicts, and I'm going to try and pick the best value for it. And repeat that until we find a satisfying assignment. So let's look at that. Let's look at what's happening here. So here is the CSP that we've been doing before. This is the same CSP that I just did with the arc consistency in here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to initialize it. We're going to select the value for every variable. And on this applet, the rectangles are going to correspond here. So the red is going to the red rectangles correspond to the conflicts. So they're the unsatisfied constraints. E is less than D is not satisfied with this random assignment. A is equal to D is not satisfied. C is not less equal to D. But not B is equal to D and not B is equal to C are both satisfied. OK, so we're just going to do. Then what we're going to do, so now that's the algorithm. So we start off with just a random assignment. And now we're going to iteratively improve it. Let's do this. So we're going to choose a variable that has the most conflicts. What's that? Which variable is, participates in the most conflicts? We can just look at the number of red arcs. E. So we're going to select E. And we're going to choose the value what looks best. So we're going to try and iter improve this the most. So we're going to choose E has the value. What value should make E? That right, we're going to choose the value, one of the values. And it's going to choose, oh. let's see what this chooses. It's going to choose 1. OK, now it still has two unsatisfied constraints. And now we're going to choose another variable which has, participates in the most conflicts, which is A. OK, then it's going to set it to a value which makes, has, minimizes the conflicts. And it's, what would it be? Two, someone said. Two. OK, then we're going to set it the one that has the most conflicts. And, it's, and when they're equal, we're going to choose it at random. So now we're going to choose one at random. This is going to choose one at random. It's going to choose E. E is going to be less than B. It's going to choose the best value. Oh, this one chooses the best value that's different. Let's look at this. Um, in here, they're all 2, 3, and 4. 4 was really bad. The 4 was bad. 3 was OK. And it really wanted to change it from 1. So it changed it to 
3 to 4. No, sorry, I'm clicking it. So change this arc, and it changed it. And we're going to step it again, and we pick another value. C is going to be less than D. Pick this, and if we keep stepping through this, we're going to find that it doesn't solve the problem. That's OK. It doesn't always work. And after a while, we're going to keep stepping through this and find that it doesn't solve the problem. So after a while of wandering through this, it didn't solve the problem. That's OK. Let's do it again. Let's run it again. And we find if we run it again, then it will just randomly change. It's going to change in the value that looks best. And well, it still doesn't solve it. It looks like it's in a loop. Let's initialize it again. Let's start to do it again. Pick another variable. And it solved it. Right, so it's going to just try to iteratively guess things, iteratively improve things until it's found a solution. Does that sort of make sense what it's trying to do? We run it again. We run it again, and it will find a solution. OK, so what it's doing is just trying to get the best constraint, trying to get the value here that's as that's best, and just try and change it. Just try to iteratively improve it as much as I can at each step. Yes? Why do you step Oh, because I restart it from a, hot, from a different place, a different assignment. There are some assignments of which it keeps changing. It can't escape. If it's this local minimum, it can't escape. We'll talk about that in a minute. So you keep getting into these local minima that you can't escape, and it keeps trying to change it, and nothing else changes. But if you start from a different point, then you can get to solve the problem quickly. Does everyone sort of understand what the algorithm is doing? OK. Well, let's. Um, so here's another. Algorithm. We're going to start with a random assignment, and we're going to repeatedly select a variable at random and select the value for that variable at random until we find a satisfying assignment. So there's another instance of this local search of this, of this random walk. OK, so there's going to be a whole lot of different variants of this random walk we're going to try and look at. So here is this Java. Uh, what's this one? Let's do oh, algorithm options, random walk. We're going to reinitialize it, and then we're going to step it. It's not very interesting which one it checks, but it's going to um, has different properties than the last one. Right, it's going to be a lot slower to find something, but it's not going to get stuck into loops. And it's probably going to take a long time to solve this. Oh, it nearly solved it. Right, it's a pretty stupid algorithm. <laughs> oh, it solved it. Right, the other one sort of didn't always solve it, but sometimes solved it fast. And this one. Effectively wanders around this space at random and then until it solves. Yes? Hmm? We're trying to solve a CSP. The CSP that they use for solving your, the universe, the constraints about assigning class exams to students, we use an algorithm like this. OK? It, tries to find a, um, it assigns people to things to students, places at random, and then tries to improve it. 
right? So it just tries to iteratively improve assignments of rooms to um, you know, times to courses. Right? So you start off with a guess and then you try to improve it. That's what this is trying to do. So you start off with a guess and then we're trying to improve it. Okay, does that make sense? And here we just start off with one guess and we're just wondering, just moving things randomly. The other guess, we're trying to improve it as much as we can. We're trying to say, oh, there's something wrong with this particular assignment to this course to this. Let's try and move it to someone else. So the conflicts in, here, in the course assignments are the particular rooms, are the particular rooms to the times to courses, right? We try and work out which is the course that's, that is, um, has the worst, the most conflicts. Let's try and move it to somewhere else. Well, you typically run this after our consistency. You typically simplify things. But it also happens that things like uh, doing course assignments, if you think about how that works, it's already art consistent. There's no thing you can prune a priori except you prune off all the, the values that you know can't work. So the sophisticated algorithms mix them up a bit more too. Once you've assigned some values at random, then you can solve other ones analytically. But just for the moment, it's just an alternative. Any other questions? All right. So there's two different algorithms we looked at. They both have, oh, let's go back. And here's another algorithm we could do, which is random sampling. For every variable, we're going to select a value at random, and then we're going to do that until we find it. We're just going to pick random values until we find it. So this is another example of a, of a local search. So one of the things we want to look at before we're actually going to look at a whole lot of algorithms. Before we look at algorithms, we want to work out how to compare these algorithms. So how do you compare these algorithms? So here's the three sort of algorithms that might happen. One solves 30 percent, solves the problem 30 percent of the time very quickly, but doesn't halt for a lot of the cases. So it sometimes solves it really fast, but sometimes goes on forever. And one solves 60 percent of the cases reasonably quickly, but doesn't solve the rest. So it's and one of them solves all the cases, problems, but which one, but really slowly. So which one do we use? Well, which one do we use? Depends how much time we have. Maybe. Which one do you, well, it's still not clear how, how, which one you choose. Yeah. Ah, that's a good idea. We'll do that too. We'll do that later. But just at the moment, we just want to compare them, right? So look at the, you can think of the mean runtime. So what's the, or the median, or the mode, or runtime, right? So if you look at the, uh, which one of these three has the lowest mean runtime? Which of these three has the lowest mean? Hmm? The third one, right? Everyone else has a mean of infinite. Right, so the first two have an infinite mean, right, because they go on forever sometimes. And when you average things in, infinity, you sort of averaged in with anything gets to be infinity. Right, so if you have infinity in there, otherwise you have some random stop, up, random stop time, in which case it becomes purely a function of that. Which one has the best median run time? In this one. What's the median? Does everyone remember what the median is? The median's the one where there's half of you below and half of you are, are ahead. So, yeah. Hmm? Right, the, sec the middle one has the best median, right? Because the first one, because you, what you're doing there is you're comparing it at 50%. Right, we're comparing it at 50%, and if it doesn't help in 50%, then it's then the median is really high, and if it halts, we're doing it at not the 50% median. And the mode doesn't make much sense either. The mode's often infinite. So what we can do in here is we can do this, is what we call a runtime distribution. And let's try and explore what this is. So what on the, the x-axis here is the, the number of steps or the time is on the x. So on the x-axis, So on the x-axis, 
is the number of steps or the time. And on the y-axis is the proportion of, of runs that, that are solved in that time. OK, and so there's the, the three things you can plot. You can plot the one that runs very quickly 30% of the time. Right, so in 30% of the time it solves. Right, it's quick, solves in very few time steps, and then it stops. It goes on for, forever. The middle line there is it solves 60% of them faster, and the, the third one it solves them slower than that. So let's look at this. So one of the things we can do is, in this one we can look at this. So what this is doing, this is the runtime distribution for random walking. And it keeps running it and just builds this distribution. So if we look at the runtime distribution for this, it slides, sort of solves 50% of the ones in about five, you know, Within 50 counts, it solves approximately 5 out of 100 times. If you look at the other algorithm that we did, um, where's the other options? We're doing just greedy descent. And we're going to solve this again. And if we run this a few times, so what we did is we ran this a number of times. And on the x-axis is how many successes in the y the x, so on the x-axis is how many steps, and the y-axis is how many times we succeeded in that. And so now we can look at something like, so the median time here is where it crosses 50%. There's no particular reason for looking at median, OK? And if you run this a few times, you'll get something similar. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to use such graphs like this to compare algorithms. So we're going to, what we're going to do next time is we're going to look at a whole lot of different algorithms, a whole lot of different options that we can do, and we're going to see how they compare with this, um, run, with this runtime distribution. Um, OK, let's, any questions? Okay, let's stop there. Here's Simon. Ones here, please.